Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Future of Retail conversation. We are so excited to be here with you all. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Danielle Gould, founder of Food Tech Connect and co-founder and co-CEO of Alpha Food Labs. Food Tech Connect is a community for food innovation. Since 2010, we've built an engaged and diverse network of 45,000 entrepreneurs, investors, executives, professionals, and more from farm to fork in 32 countries across the globe. We're best known for our biweekly newsletter and our monthly events that help you track and make sense of the business tech and investment trends in food. We have so missed gathering every month with you all and seeing you all in person and are very excited to be partnering with S2G Ventures to bring our events online. If you don't know them, S2G is one of the leading venture funds in food and ag, and they are really committed to supporting this community and to helping build a better future. And that's why we're so excited to be launching the Reimagining Food Retail Conversation with them, a four-part series exploring how this unprecedented moment in time might shape food retail over the next five years. This series was really inspired by a report that they released earlier this year entitled The Future of Food Through the Lens of Retail. We are including a link in the chat so you can download the report if you're interested in reading it. I've been tracking and helping to catalyze innovation in our food system since 2010. Over the last 10 years, you all have worked to really transform this industry. There's been an unprecedented amount of innovation, but a lot of it was necessarily incremental and built on a very complex, consolidated, under-digitized food supply chain with outdated infrastructure. The events of this year have shown a light on the cracks and disparities in our food system. While there's always been a moral imperative to do better, there is finally a real financial imperative to fundamentally reimagine the food system to make it more resilient, equitable, diverse, delicious, healthful, and climate smart. And that's why we're hosting this series. This is not just another series of Zoom events. Our goal is to create a safe space for stakeholders from farm to fork to come together to engage in discussion about how we might fundamentally reimagine the industry and create a better future. This conversation today is the first in the four part reimagining food retail series. We're gonna have three more discussions throughout January and February well, where we will be exploring how we might reimagine retail for resilience, discovery, and to better serve all stakeholders. We hope you'll join us for those discussions as well. We'll put a link in the chat now and anyone who RSVPs by Sunday will receive an additional 25% off our early bird tickets. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Jessica Murphy, Business Development Manager at S2G Ventures to tell us a little bit more about S2G and their commitment to this community. Welcome, Jessica. Danielle, thank you so much for the kind introduction and being such a great partner um, with this project. We're incredibly excited to kick off the Reimagining Food Retail series with Food Tech Connect over the next few months. We know that building a better food system isn't easy and we know that we can't do it alone. That's why we try to bring div together diverse partners and perspectives to build part of, to be part of a greater community. After all, only together can we affect real change. We're thrilled to have such a rich and wide ranging group here today. And we hope you all will enjoy us in the conversations on reimagining food and retail. If you're interested in learning more about S2G, our areas of investment interest or the over 50 companies in our portfolio, as well as insights from our team, we hope you'll connect with us online at s2gventures.com or on any of the social media platforms. Thanks so much for joining us today, everyone. Thanks, Jessica. Um, so now I'm gonna give you an overview of the day and the afternoon and tell you a little bit more about what to expect. So we're gonna start by spending about 40 minutes in moderated conversation with Walter and Audra, and then we'll have 30 minutes of group Q&A and we'll end with breakouts for some casual collisions and networking. As I said earlier, we really want this to be a safe space for discussion. We encourage healthy debate but expect that everyone will be kind, courteous, and respectful in their discourse. There is zero tolerance for hate speech or bullying and anyone who engages in either will be immediately removed. This is meant to be a lively discussion. The chat 
is your space. So feel free to introduce yourselves, to pose questions to other participants, to share ideas, to respond to comments by the speakers, to share needs or offers. Again, do whatever you like in this space, it's yours. When it, we are gonna have about 30 minutes for Q&A today, and we are using a platform called Slido. So please visit the link that we're adding in the chat to submit your questions for review, and we'll do our best to get to all of them. If you wanna ask your question live, please be sure to include your name when you submit your question. Slido helps us collect the questions and then we'll unmute you so you can ask your question live during the Q&A session. You're also able to upvote the questions that you wanna see asked. Um, another note, so if you're on social media and wanna be talking about the event, please be sure to use the hashtag food tech and we're gonna add everyone's social handles in the comments right now. Um, finally, this event is being recorded and will be published on Food Tech Connect, just so you all know. Um, we just wanna make sure that you know that. And finally, it is my great pleasure to introduce our esteemed speakers. So first I'd love to introduce Audra Kapuchinkis, um, who is the Vice President at S2G Ventures, where she focuses on unlocking value for S2G, its portfolio companies and strategic partners. Audra has spent the last year understanding the evolving food retail landscape and co-authored S2G's Future of Food through the lens of Retail Report. I've had the pleasure to work closely with Audra over the last couple of months, and I'm constantly impressed with her commitment to creating systems-based change. Walter. Walter Robb is the former co-CEO of Whole Foods Market. In 2017, he transitioned his leadership focus to mentoring and supporting the next generation of entrepreneurs th through the creation of Stonewall Rob Advisors. He is also an executive in residence at S2G Ventures and serves on the board of directors for Union Square Hospitality Group, The Container Store, Food ID, Hungry, Afria, and Appeal Sciences. He is a passionate advocate for greater food access and founded the Whole Kids Foundation. Walter has become a good friend over the last couple of years, and I've witnessed firsthand his voracious curiosity that helps him think outside of the box about how to build a better future. I've also learned so much from him about leading with heart, and I think you will too. It's truly an honor to have you both here to kick off this series. Thank you so much. All right, so we are going to kick this the questions off. You know, it is an understatement to say that 2020 has been a totally unprecedented year. It's been a reckoning with changes across all aspects of life and business, and food has been so central to that. So I'd love to kick off by asking you both, what have you learned in the last year that has transformed the way you think about food retail? Go ahead, Audra. No, I was going to say, Walter, you should kick it off. <laughs> There's so much we've learned. I mean, we, we already know that we have to eat food or we want to eat food every day unless we're fasting. But we've learned, as you said at the outset, Danielle, that it's essential. Uh, became very clear very quickly. Uh, became uh, very clear that, uh, uh, that health and safety is something we haven't thought about in terms of both the workers that are producing the food and those that are eating the food and those that are selling us the food. That health and safety has to be woven into a a more inclusive understanding of food. It became clear that food service and and um, and food retail have were separated from a supply chain perspective, and that there was major opportunities to bring those together and also deal with the the over consolidation of production in some cases. For example, with meat, uh, it became clear that um, ultimately the customer and is willing to uh, give up some of the selection that they have in order to be able to get their food. And it also became clear they were willing to do things digitally that perhaps we didn't know before, which of course you did at Food and Tech Neck. You started talking about that years before uh, on this very topic. But you know, it's everybody uses different numbers, but it's something like probably 10 years of advancement have happened in just a few months that people have said, all right, I'm gonna do this differently. So, you know, the beautiful thing about food is it touches all parts of human existence, whether it's the climate, whether it's the social determinants, whether it's the community, whether it's individual health. And so we're really at this moment in time we write about in the report that will, will we all see this moment as, as the special moment that it is, as the moment of 
opportunity that it represents is the moment of insight that it offers so that we can take these truly next steps towards a more inclusive, more sustainable food system. Over to you, Audra. Yeah, that was a, a great kickoff, Walter. Um, and I totally agree. You know, this this last year has really highlighted the central role that, that retail plays in our food system. Um, and it's the way that all of us as individuals experience how our supply chain has evolved over the last hundred years. Um, and it also provides us a path to, to look forward and, and see how things are evolving. Um, and I will say during this last year, like the one thing that I really realized was structure has such a big impact on how the industry evolves. Um, if you've got huge supply chains that are um, really heavy and not flexible, that is going to de develop a certain retail landscape and a certain set of products that are made available. And um, over the last year, you've really seen the application of new technologies and new approaches, this idea of decentralization um, being front and center. And I think as we think about refining the structure of the industry, there's just a ton of opportunities to, to provide better outcomes. Um, and I'm particularly excited about the idea of pushing forward on improvements in human health um, and tying that to the evolution of the, the retail supply chain. Awesome. You know, it's been a year filled with so much isolation, pain, grief, trauma, you know, so much. And it's never been more clear that we need to rethink leadership and the way that we build companies. Um, Walter, you know, you and I have spoken quite a bit about leading with heart. What does that mean for the food retail industry? What does it look like in, in practice? Well, I mean, leadership, leadership from the heart simply means that you're, it's, it's, uh, it's, you're using the data, of course, but you're also thinking about from the standpoint of mission and values and, and basically remember that people, that business is people first. All business happens in, with, and through people. Ultimately, the customers are people as well. And so remembering those sorts of values when you make your decisions and when, as you're moving your company forward. But I think the leadership with heart here says that there's a lot of people there that uh, are, are suffering right now. And um, so again, the COVID has exposed the, um, the connection between underserved communities, comorbidity and, and the, the COVID. It's exposed the, um, basically the, uh, the need to focus more on health and safety uh, with respect to food production. It's focused on uh, the fact that where some of the food comes from. And um, so I, what I see what I see is a pretty good job for most part, most food company CEOs, I think have started to, uh, have started to open up around, um, around their concerns for uh, whether social justice or inclusion or how they're showing up in the world or how they're thinking about their team members or how they're investing in health and safety or how they're thinking about the products they produce. I don't think we've lost the move towards a more sustainable, uh, uh, wider variety uh, uh, of foods. But I think in, the, in this year, we have had to pivot back around and really just kind of address some of these fundamental issues of where we're at right now. And um, any leader of heart is, that's not thinking or talking or engaging in those sorts of topics is probably uh, not gonna be in their position in a couple of years. So. Um, I think it's like the overall thinking here somehow is that we recognize that food and the food system and retail is the place where it is sold, uh, broadly defined, um, is such a key piece of building a more inclusive society, a more compassionate society, uh, a more intentional society that um, the role that these companies play in, in the retailers being that where the food ends up is uh, that leadership in those companies is essential. And so we wanna highlight and, and support those leaders who are doing a great job in all of those areas, bringing them forward, talking about them, involving their team members in those topics. And so this is kind of a wide ranging answer to your question, but it means paying attention and recognizing that your business is part of a larger community, serving real people, both as your workers and your customers, and with a broader set of responsibilities in the world, owning up to that, stepping up to that, stepping into that, and making that part of the business conversation. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you say, you know, just the way that you think about your curiosity, which I said earlier, you know, it's one of my favorite things about you, that you have this vor voracious curiosity for people. And maybe you could just share, you know, 
a little bit about how you think, how you use that in order to lead with heart, because I think that that's a key part of what you do. And it's a really important mindset for business leaders within retail, CBG, any business leader to think about. Right. As you interact with your team. Well, you'd have to be living, you'd have to be living in a hole under the earth, not to realize that your business has been disrupted or <laughs> affected during this time. And so you got to say to yourself, all right, what qualities do I need to cultivate in order to be able to be a better leader to help my business or our business go forward? And it's interesting that the recruiting firms are now saying that they think the predictor of good CEOs is going to be qualities like agility and curiosity. It isn't so much that they went to Harvard Business School or can break down a balance sheet. It's that they have the leadership qualities to be able to adapt, evolve, and are curious about how they could do those things. And so I think those qualities are tied directly to your ability to evolve and innovate faster. And so the question is, how are you recognizing that? How are you cultivating those qualities in yourself and in your organization is really what uh, we're talking about here. So uh, leadership itself is evolving and changing as a result of this pandemic and a result as the qualities of leadership that are required to be successful in business today. So there are a lot of cracks and disparities in our food system that have become apparent over the last year. And there's this real imperative to fundamentally reimagine the industry to make it more resilient, more equitable, diverse, delicious, healthful, and climate smart. If you were to start over, how would you design a 21st century grocery store? And you know, how would you design it better to serve all stakeholders? Is that for me or for yeah. Audra? I, I, I would start with you. Yeah. And then okay. I'd, you know, I'd think. Well, I've, I've probably designed a th over a thousand grocery stores. So it's my favorite thing to do. I'd get my roll of tracing paper out and start working on it. But the future of retail is hybrid. We're, we know that now. We know that the customer likes to shop. We know the customer likes to order digitally. And we know that because we can see it across multiple generations. It's not just a millennial thing. It's, that's, the, that's the significance of the moment of time is that how people shop and how they interact with their brands has, has, has shifted in a way that we're not gonna go back. Doug McMillan from Walmart has said that. Many other people have said that, have said, you know what, we're just not gonna go back to that. So the hybrid future is designing a store of the future is gonna be, depending on your business, your retail business, you're gonna design for both of those or all of those channels simultaneously, which is to say, the physical part is still going to focus on really telling stories and having great experiences and interactivity and um, that you can't simply can't get online. I know that I'm a person who loves to be around people and I am dying right now having to sit on this stupid Zoom all the time when I really wish I could be hanging out with Audra, having a pizza and a beer, but it's not possible right now. So, uh, but you're going to design that store on the other side when we can start to see, you know, six months from now that there's going to start to be people coming back. They're going to want some place to connect. There's going to be some experience. There's going to you got to give them a reason to come. And because right now the trips are down so significantly for retail, um, and so experience. I would design experience. I would design profile. I would involve the local producers. I would show processes for how food is made. I would let them taste it and eat it. And I would, uh, you know, just do all those sorts of things that you can only do in a physical store. At the same time. I would integrate the uh, online channel, both, both in terms of in-store by using technology to provide customers options to make their shop easier, to personalize their shop, to find adjacent items, to have certain experiences or comparison opportunities within the store using their app, to use their shopping list, to make it easier for them, at the same time as giving them a pure play digital option um, that they could access anytime, anywhere. So I think that you've seen this with some of the new uh, Burger King stores designing the, um, you know, the drive up lanes front and center. You see it in the new Amazon Fresh stores, putting the digital uh, shopping option or the curbside pickup option front and center. You see it with Starbucks designing these new mini Starbucks where they're 800 square feet, where you, they're only made for digital pickup. There's no sitting around. So we're going to see, a, a, you know, I would, I would think about not one size fits all, but I would design stores that fit the different occasions that and different cities and different situations that the customer wants. I would, I would have a range of formats, but they would all have an experience component and they would all have a digital component. They would obviously all have the safety component handled. Um, and I would think also that, that um, 
we would have we would have try to integrate those in a ways that made it very clear to the customer that um, if they come first, we're serving them with our full range of product, and they can get it uh, however they want it, whenever they want it. So the data is very clear out there right now from all the public companies that have announced that those companies that are doing both are seeing a, a stickier a stickier result in terms of their customers' uh, lifetime value. And those customers are ordering 20, 25% more product as a result of being able to do that and stay within the ecosystem. So as I design the future store, which I will do again one day, um, it will be rich and robust physically. It will be rich and robust digitally. It'll be integrated so that I'm using the store to fulfill uh, locally. I might maybe have some of those robots running around within three miles to deliver the packages contactless. And it'll be reaffirming um, what I write about in my blog posts on Stonewall Rob, that retail is art and science. We now know more about what both of those look like in the future retail, you know, and what we miss. And um, it'll also be, um, we'll get back into rhythm. And right now we're out of retail rhythm. We all know what, you know, phone rhythm is, you know, four, one, five, five, you know, when, when somebody screws that up, you can't get the number, right? The retail rhythm is we get up and, you know, we have a certain pattern of how we shop. Well, you know, Saturday is no longer the biggest day in retail. Monday is why nobody's going to lunch anymore. These rhythms are all screwed up. So we got we to gotta get back into some sort of a cadence around that, what that's actually going to look like in terms of office use, who's working for home, you know, how those patterns readjust and how we need to adjust the retail to serve that we don't yet know. That's one of the great unknown questions. We know it'll be hybrid. We just don't know what the cadence of the shopper will be uh, on the other side. Great. Um Audra, this series was really inspired by a report that you and Walter co-authored entitled The Future of Food Through the Lens of Retail. Could you talk a little bit about the thesis of the report and how you're thinking around how content, commerce, and community will shape retail over the next five years? Yeah, for sure. And this actually drives quite well with um, some of the comments that, that Walter had um, just now. So, um, you know, looking at what happened in the last year, uh, we're in a pivotal moment in time. Um, you know, it's similar to the fundamental shift that happened in 1916 when the self-service grocery store was created, um, or the shift in the 1930s when the first supermarket was created. Um, we're in a moment in time where individuals have more options than ever in terms of where to shop and how to shop. Um, there's a whole spectrum of products um, ranging from conventional products, um, comfort foods that saw such a spike um, in the beginning of, of the uh, pandemic um, through to you know, emerging brands that are really focused on better for you, better for planet messaging um, and, and actually like conviction and, and values. So, um, so for us, when we took a step back and thought about what does tomorrow's landscape look like and who wins? Um, we really think that it has to be kind of a trifecta of, of three really core items. So on the content side, really thinking about what products you create or what products you choose to sell. Um, and retailers, I mean, retailers have served as a cornerstone of the community for a hundred years. Um, you know, everyone is consistently going to their uh, grocery retailer to stock up. The, the retailer that they choose obviously um, has implications around what they value and, and what drives their trust. Um, but, you know, from a content perspective, um, retailers really have the option to think deeply about, um, as Walter mentioned, the stakeholders that they're engaging with. Um, and the second order impact of that is the products that they carry. So if you really care about your community that you're located um, in, if you really care about, um, you know, climate change, if you really care about uh, women-led businesses, then prove it. Carry the products that showcase um, these attributes and, and uh, highlight them. Give them a path to market. Um, the second critical piece is commerce. So um, operations, you know, at the, at the beginning of pandemic, everyone was just kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall in terms of how they keep up, how they evolve their businesses in order to service the market that we're in. Um, and we think, you know, particularly you look at this Bain report, they looked at the economics that exist with folks, um, you know, picking in store versus having dark stores versus um, investing in micro fulfillment. Um, and 
we think that there's significant opportunity to invest in these technology systems. You see a huge uptick in private equity firms and warehouses because they're expecting more digital activity to mean uh, like increasing needs on the, the warehousing and distribution side of things. Um, and we think that, as Walter mentioned, for folks to win in the future, you really need to lean into this and make those investments and be proactive. Um, it isn't, you won't be able to keep up if you're just constantly putting band-aids over things. Um, and then the third piece is um, thinking about community and stakeholder engagement. Um, the business roundtable, as I'm guessing most folks know, um, has made it very clear that leadership teams across uh, the world are thinking differently about um, what success in business means. Um, and I love um, something that Lorna Davis talks about, which is we are all part of a river and every act action that we take, whether you're a customer or a retailer, it has impacts both upstream and downstream. And to pretend that you exist in a silo, um, that just won't work anymore because technology is providing more visibility than ever before. Um, and there's really no place to hide. So if you say that you're one thing, um, you better be able to, to prove it and be authentic about it. Um, so yeah, so that intersection between um, content, the products you sell, commerce, how you sell them, and community, how you engage with the folks around you, we think is going to be the, the foundation of tomorrow's businesses. Thank you. Um, you know, I think one big focus area in, in the report was, you know, focusing on the um, adoption, the technology adoption that's happening among retailers. So your brick and mortar retailers are adopting technologies at warp speed. And as they invest in automation and robotics and omni-channel and smart fulfillment, how do you think that these, re these technologies are going to impact retail? how should retailers be thinking about technology adoption to deliver on the vision that we talked about earlier for how you build a more inclusive, more you know, um, sustainable future of retail? But retailers should be thinking about this as essential. They should think about technology as capability, capability to serve their customer. Remember the purpose of retail is to serve your customer, right? To serve your customer in your community. And, the, the impact of that is to remember to Audra's point is it goes all the way up the value chain in food. So when the customer adopts something, when you're serving the customer, it's going to affect the distributors, it's going to affect the producers, it's going to affect the farmers, it's going to affect the environment. So remember that that change ultimately starts with the customer who says, yes, this is something I want. But what the customer, what, what the retailer has to do now is recognize that the use of data and technology is absolutely table stakes to be able to serve the customer today. And I don't just mean about putting in the systems that allow them to deliver at curbside contactless or to deliver at home. Those are obvious uh, infrastructure investments that are necessary. I'm talking about investing in your app, investing in your digital marketing capabilities, investing in your uh, capabilities to serve the customer that went in their store, investing in your team members through uh, uh, platforms that let them learn a learning management system that allows information to spread more quickly. Uh, investing in platforms that connect you with your suppliers so you have real-time uh, transparency into your supply chain so that you can fulfill more effectively. There are new tools that allow you to order your fresh food uh, more effectively using AI and machine learning so that you don't waste so much food when you order. You know, there are all sorts of tool sets developing that let you organize the data that you're collecting uh, for your customer. Data is the currency of business in the 21st century. To compete, you're going to need to know who your customers are and what they're shopping for, and they're gonna to wanna to know that you know them. So any way you look, any way you look, 360 degrees is an investment. Now, are you, are you gonna chase shiny, shiny toys? No, as a, as a former CEO myself, I understand there's a lot of CEOs out there in places to spend your money and capital allocation is one of the major responsibilities of a CEO, but the CTO and that team, the chief digital officer gotta sit right at the top table with you as you think about this thing, they've got to be completely integrated into the go-to-market plan for a retailer. And um, they ha you have to make the investments necessary through a strategic roadmap to have the capability that you need to serve your customers. Now, there's a number of ways to get those capabilities. There's many capable companies where you can actually go out there and lease it or borrow it or SaaS it or whatever you need to get those capabilities. But if you don't have them, you're going to be at a real disadvantage going forward. So what I guess the moment in time, and because the adoption of customers has made it very clear 
they're ready to do these pathways is you have got to make these investments now. You can't cheap on them. There's something called the Gartner Index, G-A-R-T-N-E-R. -E Some of you may know that, that tracks uh, investment as a percentage of sales by industry. And you certainly want to check the Gartner Index for your particular vertical and make sure on food, it should be somewhere around 2%, 2 1.5%. Um, you want to see where you are in terms of making sure you're investing the right amount of money to give yourself the right technologies, to give yourself the right capabilities, which is all it is, uh, to serve your customers. That's what it is. It's not technology for technology's sake. It's technology that puts you in a position to take care of your customers, keep your customers, and serve them well. And I think that that's um, very well said, Walter. Um, I think what's also starting as a way to optimize operations for retailers is also laying the groundwork of tomorrow's retail ecosystem. Um, and so like, you think about smart checkout systems or cashierless checkout systems, like that became necessarily in the beginning of the pandemic so that you could get people safely through the store. Um, but now that allows you to like develop an app and have customers check in with the cashierless um, POS system with their app. And you can then start collecting data on a number of different attributes that prior to this point have really not been possible. Um, and so when I think about the future of retail and what this might become, um, I'm really excited about it because it does feel like we can perhaps learn something from the software industry and think about the holistic customer journey and not online or digital, but rather what problem am I solving for the customer and how do I get to them and what do I put in front of them? Um, and step one is investing in um, these solutions that allow you to deliver product more efficiently, to be safer, um, to start aggregating data that can later be used to, um, to build these systems that are much more personalized and um, move into a, a different kind of industry structure. Yeah, and two resources that the group might be interested in that I use, one is MIT puts out a technology review magazine and I'm not a techie per se, I'm, a, I'm a definitely a student of technology. So I read the technology review to sort of see what's out there, what people are talking about. And there's another, there's a site called Verge, which also does reviews of technologies and products, which might be interesting place for, for you to start and look at a, you know, just get a, a view into the world there. There's also a lot of hype in technology that things are being promised that will take a while to be delivered. Self-driving cars being a good example of that right now. But, um, but nonetheless, there are some very um, wonderful fundamental technologies and young technology companies that, that you could uh, do, run pilots with and that you can try things with. And, um, you know, I think about Domino's being a, uh, one of the first digital adopters in retail. And, you know, it's interesting. The corollary that has to happen here is that the, we all know the richness of going in to get a cup of coffee at a retail Starbucks or coffee shop of our, of our choice. Uh, it's pretty hard to replicate that experience online. You go online, you order it. So it's transactional, it's functional. There's just not a lot of experience in it. You know, there's nobody making you feel good, you know, when you do it. And so what Domino's recently did is say, well, when you order a pizza, tell us where you want us to put it on your, on your stoop. And so we'll try to put it there. That's at least a step towards making the experience a little more personal, right? Which, which is going to have to happen over time where, uh, some more human features get built into those applications, not just strictly the uh, fulfillment, you know, functional aspects of it, but there's some experiential aspects built into that, like what you see with Ulta doing now, Ulta, Ulta Beauty, which is one of my favorite retailers, Mary Dillon, a great CEO. They've got the tools on there where you can actually try your makeup. I mean, I wouldn't try my makeup on because I don't have makeup, but you would try makeup on and you could do it virtually and have some sense of the experience, right? Um, that, that at Warby Parker being another example where you can really get your eyes examined and the glasses fitted before they're sent to you. Those sorts of things, these worlds are gonna, just like, just like uh, you know, pickup and delivery and store are gonna combine as delivery gets to be 30 minutes. What's the difference between shopping and getting it delivered in 30 minutes? These worlds are beginning to touch. The same thing is gonna happen with the physical and the digital worlds are gonna start to get closer and closer as the customer, again, at the center of it all, looks for a seamless experience of being able to do what they want to do when they want to do it. And the retailer's job is going to be to serve them uh, using these various sets of tools, technologies, and data. 
Yeah, I think that, you know, I would also just want to add that I think it's important for retailers to think, building on what Audra said earlier about the whole journey for all the stakeholders who are involved and who are going to, it's that the with their customers, short, that is very important. But I think also thinking about the farmers, the distributors, everyone else along the value chain, super important to think about how the technology is impacting them and partnering with them. Um, so I know that you both are big fans of data. Um, and now that we have more people shopping online, you know, we have more data than ever before. Um, about with people's shopping behaviors or preferences, what new opportunities do you think this data might unlock across the value chain over the next five years? What are you most excited about? Well, I think, you know, again, the, the heart of retail is getting to know your customer. When I learned retail in the 70s, it was, um, I learned from a guy that ran a hardware store and he, he taught me to first ask the customer, well, how are you today? And how's your family? And there was that sort of personal thing. And I think that data is going to allow a company to know a person a little bit better, um, you know, maybe not exactly in the way that, that Dick Morris did at the hardware store, but he's going to begin to let you know who this person is. And I think the person is going to be able to give you the data to the more extent they feel like they know who you are. So it's going to, it's going to build some intimacy digitally in a way that doesn't exist particularly right now. But I think also it is going to allow for, um, from the customer's perspective, uh, it's going to allow for more ease. That is to say, say a shopping list that's pre-populated, uh, a delivery time that's preset, a fulfillment order that's redone or could be done when they get to the store. Those sorts of convenient services are going to be empowered by data. But then more importantly, I think the profile and um, the, the ability to suggest, oh, hi, Danielle, nice to see you. I see you want to order today. Here's our order that we would suggest for you based on everything you've done up to this point. How do you like this order? Would you like to add or subtract? I mean, those sorts of um, things that I could do as a store clerk with you would be done uh, for you on the digital relationship. And I think data will allow that to happen. But, you know, as we slice and dice this data and we start to learn more about what people are doing, it's going to provide a tremendous amounts of insights for innovation. Um, you know, people have allergies, food allergies. So uh, there's going to be new tools that allow people to shop more carefully, more responsibly. Uh, that'll be built right into the app or built right into the digital experience. That's an example. I think that's going to be kind of cool. That's that's coming very soon. Um, so let me stop there and throw it to Audra. Yeah, yeah, that's great, Walter. Um, and so I think um, I think a few things like because the cost of sensors and data has come down so drastically in the last few years. Um, you're starting to be able to do things that previously were just not economically viable. So, um, so one thing that we talk a lot about internally is um, building trust across the supply chain. Um, and previously, you know, we lived in an affidavit-based system, but now internally we talk a lot about trust but verify. Um, so you're expected to have a smart contract or you're expected to have a QR code that goes back to the farm that the chicken comes from. Um, we've got a company called Shenandoah Valley Organic that does that. And I think that's a great example of using data, new technologies to connect consumers with where their food comes from. It's not just a marketing claim or like a label or packaging. It's the real deal. And you could dig into like real people and real places that consumers can choose to support with, with their dollars. Um, I, I think the other piece to think about is um, just this like micro level of understanding of consumer groups and what that allows you to do. Um, so if you think about Netflix, um, when Netflix came online, um, they suddenly were creating content that previously was considered too niche. And so with this um, explosion of data, you're really able to drill in and identify different affinity groups, um, different needs that perhaps were glossed over because they were too niche. Um, another thing that we talk about internally is the riches are in the niches. So if you are a brand company and you're working on scaling a business, um, we're in a, a renaissance era where new um, distribution channels, new technologies are enabling you to tap into people or groups of folks that are really interested in what you're, what you're building. Um, so, so I think that there's going to be some disintermediation and decentralization in the food system that reflects that. Um, and there's a ton of opportunity to use data to think about 
like fueling product innovation, um, developing like new product lines specifically tailored to certain groups. Um, so whether it's, you know, lines focused on um, like millennial moms and, and going really deep on a regional basis or with certain allergen considerations, or perhaps it's health considerations and working with folks to treat, you know, chronic conditions or manage a uh, cancer diagnosis or whatever. Um, I, I think that data is really allowing you to drill in deeper to understand, again, what the customer needs, what their journey is, how you could serve up that product and how you could continue to expand that platform um, to further fit the customer's needs. Yeah, to Audrey's point, the, the data will certainly enable the transparency and accountability, the transparency around where product is from. You'll be able to scan a barcode and see the story of a piece of cauliflower uh, that will be clear. The accountability also, I think we talk about our companies doing what they're saying. All that will be, uh, there'll be a ledger of all that in the data trail that, you know, you'll be able to follow and confirm and, and confirm and that, that these things are happening. But also, you know, with data, what's happening to these new tool sets are allowing you to look at a customer across text, across data, or a text, email, social platforms. Um, and, you know, you'll have a holistic view of the customer of our, ourselves of how we actually shop across these different channels or different mediums of communication. It'd be interesting as, as retail moves on to social, in other words, you go on a platform, you're going to have the opportunity to buy right off the platform. And so these worlds are going to kind of blend and merge. The data will be very rich in terms of having a complete understanding of how we actually uh, buy food in the world. So you know, we're on the verge here. You know, I mean, you know, these social platforms, one of the reasons Walmart wanted TikTok was they wanted to be able to out there and pitch the user of TikTok and say, all right, here's something you see. You want to get it? You know, press this button and buy it and we'll send it to you, right? So that just couldn't have happened three years ago. And um, that that sort of, A, the additional options are going to be available, the different channels can be available, but then the data that comes from all that behavior aggregated by these new uh, data platforms that are available, like... Um, you know, Twilio just bought one, I forget the name of it, but that it looks holistically across the different ways in which customers shop. All that's going to present a new realm of possibility for innovation for retail to serve the customers in ways we, we can't yet imagine. Well, I am, a, I don't know about you, but I'm really excited for this future. Um, and I have a ton more questions, but would love to actually hear from the community. So we are gonna move into the next portion of this discussion where we have a group conversation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, for today's Q&A, we're using a platform called Slido, and you can visit the link in the chat to submit your questions, and we'll do our best to get to all of them. Um, please be sure to include your name. A lot of people have been posting anonymous questions, and we'll, we'll try and get to those um, at the end, but we're going to give priority to people who share their name, and we will unmute you so you can ask your question live. Um, so we are going to, for our first question, we have John Ford. Hi there, good to see you all. Um, so um, I run Once Upon a Farm, which is a refrigerated uh, kid food business, and we sell to all channels in the U.S. And my question is, give us your insights on the future of retail uh, at the conflict of two big things. One is every store now serving as a fulfillment center in a picking warehouse for fulfillment of online commerce, however the retailer is doing that. Um, and the assortment reductions that are coming with that. Most retailers are cutting assortment by 20 to 25% to accommodate holding better in stocks on that business as it's surged. And then the flip side of that is the retail experience, um, discovery, um, broad assortment, the things that um, make retail so pleasurable for so many consumers. How do you see that all playing out over the next two to three years and what should people who run CPG companies or that are in retail be thinking about as, as it relates to that conflict? Well, everybody should know John Forker, one of the finest CEOs in the, in the retail food industry and the food industry yeah. and good friend. So uh, he's a humble guy, but um, you all should check out his website and his uh, postings on values and business and leadership from the heart. That's John. So love the questions. Um, Look, it looks to me like on fulfillment, there's going to be uh, there's going to be there's multiple options being pursued, John. There's the uh, what they call the uh, MFCs, mi micro micro fulfillment centers, which are 10 to 15,000 square foot centers plopped on the back of stores. There's a couple of companies building those. 
because Kroger has partnered up with uh, Okado, which is building a regionalized, mechanized, uh, roboticized warehouse to serve uh, to serve a larger area. And then there's just the you know, old fashioned right now having the fulfillment arm, the, the fi folks running through the store, picking the orders, uh, trying to pick the orders around customers. And they've got all three of these things working simultaneously. They all have their challenges. None of them, as far as I can tell yet, have solved the last mile problem in terms of profitability. So there's still a lot of work and innovation to go. Uh, right now, I think people do see um, there do you see the conflict between customers shopping and having a pleasurable experience and then having folks run them over with the carts filling these orders. So right now it hasn't really been resolved. It's something that's definitely in the air where people complain about it. And I do think that the fulfillment function will uh, tend to migrate towards, um, there'll be a dedicated area, uh, but they'll, they're, and you also see dark stores with retailers setting up dark stores to be able to fulfill from that perspective in the busy cities. But it's still sorting itself out. And I do think that customers have made it clear they have a certain sensitivity to uh, being run over by the, by the uh, picking workers. So uh, I, I suspect that'll be the next place where you know, there'll be some shift of hours or some shift of, of process to where um, you know, there's some less pressure on it from that perspective. But I don't think the fulfillment thing is going to be solved by any one thing. It's going to be solved by all of those things and some combination of things. It may vary by retailer. And uh, there is some inherent conflict in there, which isn't go away for the next bit of time. And then with respect to your second question, I think that, um, which is really around, uh, I think telling the story uh, in this new world order. I think the, the brands like yours, you're gonna have to take more responsibility for telling your story because the discovery, it's hard to answer this question right now because we're in the COVID where folks have, have, have skinned down their list we have producers have cut down the number of SKUs they produce. The distributors tell me, even the main ones tell me they're still running 70, 80%. They're not even close to 100% right now. They're 10, 15 points off, off where they normally would run. So A, the pipe, the pipe itself is, is smaller and B, the pipe is not even full. And you have, uh, you have customers who are staying at home because they're concerned and trying these other things where discovery is less at a premium. So it, it means you gotta have a D2C channel it means you've got to learn to be a storyteller yourself. It means you've got to get involved in social commerce where you can communicate through those platforms with your customers. And it means you've got to beef up that muscle within your company to tell your story as you've done very well, really, because uh, it's going to be a while till we get back to something like what we've seen before. And even when we do, it's going to be a hybrid situation. And that storytelling is going to have to happen digitally. So these are two really good questions around how retail is going to evolve over the next number of years. The, the physical store never goes away. It just doesn't. It's too important. It's too much part of you know, how we shop. And, and there'll be those opportunities again uh, for that leisurely stroll to the supermarket aisles to look and see. But it'll never be exactly the same as it was because the trips are not going to come back at the level that they were. Therefore, uh, for you, I think, again, developing your muscle in multiple channels is really essential. Thanks, John. And, Thank you. and that was great. Um, great. Okay, so our next question is from Andre Main. Andre. Hi, Andrew. Andrew, sorry. Hey, how are you? Um, thanks for taking my question. Um, I'm from Stanford University. Uh, really. Um, Walter, you made a, a reference earlier about uh, relationships and you know, even just going into a Starbucks. I mean, you have that in-person relationship. Um, do you think that the uh, retail companies of the future need to have a different ownership structure in terms of maybe moving towards more of a community-based ownership or a co-op based, which um, does create the relationship? So in times like this, you do get more, it's almost a reversal where instead of retail servicing the customer, the customer actually supports the business through times like this, and you get the loyalty and it's it's almost a flip uh, through that ownership structure. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I do know there's very robust conversations going on in the natural food industry. Uh, Carlotta Mast uh, has been leading those conversations along with um, um, the Jedi Collaborative Group around some of these issues. But I don't think inherently, uh, I don't think inherently, I am a fellow a graduate there of the university. So um, uh, I like your backdrop there too with the, that's some good retail, some good retailing on a retail podcast. So, um, but I don't think there's anything inherently 
uh, stronger about a co-op versus a well-run retail store. So I wouldn't give the nod and say, this means there's going to be more co-ops. I mean, co-ops have struggled, except yeah. in cities like Minneapolis and uh, say Portland, Oregon, other places where the kind of the culture sort of lends itself to it. I think it's much more around how does the retailer of the moment recognize how responsible and how important the customer is and how do they tilt themselves and their culture towards serving that? Those that don't are going to be out of business. They honestly will. If they don't do that and they don't invest in the technology, they're going to struggle to, to gain share. And because we have too many online options and too many places that have recognized how important the customer is. So I do think that uh, different retailers are in different places. A lot of people say things and it doesn't really show up, right? I had an experience last night on Comcast. It was a nightmare. I was talking to a bot for 20 minutes and it's like, I might as well shoot myself uh, then do that experience again. But, um, but I think the... Um, I do think that out of this, what I have seen, and particularly in the early days of the pandemic, was a deeper appreciation for those who bring us our food, right? It's hard work to work retail. It's not easy work. And they were putting themselves in harm's way by helping us. They continue to do that, whether they're at the warehouse or whether they're at the store. And I think most retailers realize just how essential uh, the workers were and also how essential the work they were doing as grocers was. So I would hope that what comes out of this we know this will be behind us in say six to eight months, maybe that there'll be a, a, a lasting re re realization around just how important those relationships are with the customers and the team members. And we would see an enduring change in retailing as a result of that. Now, maybe that's too much to ask, uh, but I don't, I don't think it's a matter of a big business or a little business or a co-op business or a poor profit business. I think it's a function more of the leadership and of the culture of those companies that will provide that sort of experience. And I would like to see the dialogue really around some of the places where Danielle was going earlier around, how do we create, how do we support, how do we make retail operations that have more of these sorts of qualities, you know, and how do we highlight those that are really doing a good job with that, whether it's customers, whether it's inclusion, whether it's diversity of food. Um, I don't think it's the format. I think it's much more the leadership and the culture. Thank you for your question, Andrew. Thank you. Um, next, we have Mike Coates. Uh, yeah, to Walter and Audrey, I just uh, wanted to ask you guys uh, what kind of chances and opportunities you guys see in micro fulfillment offering to smaller producers and pool innovation with all the current changes in the marketplace. I will say this is something that comes up consistently um, across our portfolio. Um, you know, there's a huge opportunity to really take a hard look at the economics that are in play and think about how do you think about alternative models, creative models, partnerships um, that em empower brands to, to reach their consumers through different channels. Um, I, you know, Walter, I don't know if you have any specific um, thoughts on this? Well, um, I don't think, I think it's getting harder. I think it's interesting, the growth that we saw before the pandemic, we saw that what we call the challenger brands, Audra, um, and maybe we could post that slide for folks. The, the growth in the challenger brands was accelerating uh, much faster than the legacy brands. But what we saw in the pandemic was that the folks reverted back to some of these brands. I mean, even like spam, they went back and said, well, I know this brand, so I want it. So uh, we're, we're dealing now, and, and, and manufacturers across the board pretty much discontinued their C&D items and focused on their A and B items. Uh, and they just said that, and they found out customers were happy with that during this COVID time. Now, post-COVID, as we open back up and restaurants again will open back up, which is one of the great places where we experiment with ingredients, that's probably going to happen fairly incrementally. So I think the answer for the smaller brands is, um, A, it's got to be something truly innovative. In other words, is it cell-based meat? Is it using a new uh, a, a wild grain that hasn't been used before? Is it a new functional ingredient that we haven't seen? There's always going to be room for an innovation in food uh, and more now than ever. Uh, but second of all, you're going to have to use these other channels uh, to amplify your voice yourself, the D2C, the social, you know, hooking up on the social platforms to get yourself. And third is a technique of partnership. I really think that many brands try to go it alone. They're, they're going two, three, four, five million in annual sales. That's a tough go with a big spend, hard to get the consumer's attention, too many websites. So 
finding a partnership, whether it's for a nonprofit or another for-profit where you can link up and amplify your voice. And uh, that has worked very well for some of the smaller brands who have connected with larger brands and have used that pathway to accelerate uh, there. Now, some sell out and just go away, but some actually develop partnerships that are very creative in terms of getting their story out there. Um, so those are some thoughts for you on that question. It's a good question. There are about, there are about 40,000 items in an average Whole Foods. Um, you know, that's a lot of items. Uh, if you go to this bigger supermarkets, they're up in the 60, 70,000. Think about that number of items that a customer has to, you know, peruse when they go in there. Think about how much harder that is to look at them online. I know when you go online this, you, yourself, you tend to just kind of limit it down. So, so that, that process of finding those smaller brands that have a, a, a big story to tell, um, they, again, like I was saying to John, are going to have to find new ways to take on some of that storytelling responsibility themselves. There are brands like Sweetgreen, for example, that has built themselves digitally native. Uh, they never did much advertising. They did events. They did events in every city as a way of communicating who they were. Uh, you know, they did different programs like that. So I think the innovation could also be in how you're communicating your story. Um, and without the, when, with the trade shows being virtual for the last couple of years, it's been very difficult because that's a lot of time where people found brands when they were walking the aisles and stuff. It's been very difficult. And I do think, I do not think that the uh, producers go back to producing all the items. I don't think the customer goes back to finding all the items for the next year and a half. I think it's going to be a, a tougher time in terms of discovery. And so it's going to re require some wiliness on the part of the smaller brands to really get their story out there. Farmers markets, D 2 C channel network, social commerce. These are some of the ways in which they can do it. And, uh, using the press, how they can, getting stories and partnerships. Don't look past partnerships. They can be very, very powerful. Uh, Whole Foods, for example, uh, has a local um, restaurateur program. So every city there's partners up with a different local restaurateur to put a store, a restaurant within the store. So that restaurant probably in and of itself would have a hard time getting a foothold. But when they do it in Whole Foods, there's a nice partnership that allows that restaurant and that name to get recognized. So that's another good way to go. Great. Thanks for your question, Mike. Um, next up, we have Peter Drost. Hi there. Um, hey. Hello. It's been a wonderful conversation to be a part of, and uh, it's been great to hear all of you talk about like the esoteric and the sort of universal. And I have a question about a few of those more universal elements. Um, when you were talking about leading with heart, you spoke about you know a lot of the markers of curiosity and agility. Um, being these practices that a lot of, uh, you know, the new, the new chapter of leadership will have to cultivate. And I just wonder for both of you, you know, what do you do to cultivate your curiosity and your agility as a practice? Well, um, I do what Audra tells me to do. And then I <laughs> maybe change it a little bit. No, I mean, listen, we all, um, we all, we all, if, you, if you're honest with yourself, we all hit this point and you know, we're, we're facing an issue or a decision. We all hit this point where we stop, okay? We just do. We say, that's it. I can only go that far or I can only do that. And what you wanna do is use your consciousness to recognize uh, in that moment, uh, I, oh, I hit my stop point. I gotta, how do I push myself past that even though I don't want to or even though I'm not trained to do that? So it's, it's using your awareness and your consciousness to um, to push yourself past that stop point that everybody has and everybody, it's their comfort zone, you know? And, uh, you know, the famous Eleanor Roosevelt quote, you must do that very thing that you don't want to do type of thing. But more importantly, recognize that business by its very nature is, is the whole joy of business is you get up in the morning and business brings you stuff that you didn't anticipate. It throws, it throws stuff at you every single day. And it's, it's asking yourself, how are you meeting that moment when the challenge comes? Are you stiffening or are you opening? And um, that's what I've been trying to do with myself is just, all right, I didn't expect this one, but I'm going to check myself at the door and I'm going to try to open up and think about how I could solve this or work on it differently. So I think it's a matter of just incremental daily practice using your awareness to see where the places are you're stopping yourself. And um, I also think you should be a lifelong learner. I think that's really important. You should find ways to read something every day um, build a network of people you can you can talk to and say, hey, what are you thinking about? Or what are you reading? 
Um, you should read as much as you can and just continually open yourself up. In fact, there is so much to learn out there. It's mind blowing. It's overwhelming. But just uh, however you do that, make yourself a lifelong learner. I can attest to the fact every time I talk to Walter, he says, what should I be reading? Who should I be talking to? Who are you talking to? Mm-hmm. It's a great question. Yeah. Um, Walter, what's to your, your point answer, about... Chris? What's your answer to it? Me or Danielle? I would like to hear Danielle's ideas. Um, I mean, I just, I love asking people questions. I love talking to people. I mean, I read, I mean, I'm a voracious reader. The, our newsletter came out of, that's what my reading consumption is like, you know, where I'm constantly trying to learn and understand and take inspiration from, from other, um, uh, from other industries. I love travel, um, but I feel like I learn the most by just trying to speak to as many people as possible. And, you know, the great thing in my work is that I'm able to do that I, either, you know, through the events, um, through the research that I do for my other consulting business, Alpha Food Labs, we just get to interview a ton of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just doing some personal writing to try and synthesize. But yeah, just trying to connect with people, I would say, and reading as much as possible. I love it. Our, uh, Walter, in regards to like stiffening or opening, um, I was part of this process where, you know, you kind of have to stop and identify where, like locate yourself. Are you above the line or are you below the line? And are you responding to certain situations because of where you're located? Um, I find that is super helpful just to like process why, um, why I'm responding positively or negatively to something. But um, yeah, I generally just like to throw myself into opportunities or projects that I have no business being part of uh, and just using that as a way to um, get exposed. So like lately I've been really fascinated with data science and what you could do with it and like talking to these amazing um, microbiologists with PhDs um, to understand what they've been thinking about. Um, I think that's just, you know, there's so many similarities and parallels that you could draw from that to building a brand or working in retail, you know? Yeah. And another thing is, this is from uh, John's book uh, on conscious leadership, really talks about trade-offs. Most of us assume that the trade-offs are real, but when you get to a trade-off, um, you know, sometimes if you use your creative brain, you can, uh, you can find your way to a, to, a, to, to a win-win trade-off, right? So an example from the early days of Whole Foods, people said, hey, you should put farmer's markets in your parking lots. And people, well, why would we do that? We'd sell less produce. But if it turns out, if you think about it, that the customers loved it, the team members loved it, the communities loved it, the producers loved it. So it was a win-win to actually do it. And we tried it and learned some things from that. So when you face a situation that seems like it's an impossible trade-off, ask yourself if there's some creative way to create a win-win uh, rather than a win-lose. Great. Thank you so much for the question, Peter. People have been responding in the comments I've been following and they've really loved it. So, and thank you for your response, everyone. Um, Okay, so up next we have Harry Rhodes. Hi, everybody. Uh, Walter, good to see you again. It's been a while. It has. Um, I'm now with uh, Food Animal Concerns Trust with FACT. And we work nationally to make sure that all food producing animals are raised in a healthy and humane manner and make sure that all food uh, from animals getting to people's plate is healthy and safe to eat. And um, wondering how we work with a network of thousands of farmers all over the country, how can they best make sure that what they're selling to through the retail market is uh, they get their fair share of that and um, that it's worthwhile for them to be working with retail stores. What do we tell the farmers in our network? Yeah, so for those you don't know, Harry started out on the south side of Chicago uh, with a beautiful um, um, operation that was teaching people how to garden and farm and sell his fresh produce, including to Whole Foods and uh, built a beautiful organization there in that community, which is, which is definitely an underserved community. And um, 
in terms of your question about that, it is a question I get all the time from meat producers who are, you know, a lot of them start out at farmers markets because they can build their connection mm -hmm. directly to the customer and they build their, they build their uh, business that way, uh, which is obviously a way for them to get the best price for their product because they're selling it directly without any, without any folks in the middle. Um, the second thing really is around, uh, there's some of these new digital uh, meat boxes like Oink and uh, uh, Butcher Box mm -hmm. and others that have been created that are, that are uh, and even the Audubon Society now has a program where they've created uh, a, a, a subscription box of meats. And I would I'd encourage you to think about either A, partnering up with one of those, Harry, or, or creating one of your own. Uh, that allows people to tap into your particular set of values through their meat purchases. Those are out there, they're working, the robust the business models seem to work with D2C um, and they've been able to build some nice brands around the set of values that they represent. Uh, beyond that, I think just it comes down to you being able to establish a relationship with a local retailer who's gonna be able to tell your story at the counter and give you the prop proper price. And you know, there, there it is harder because there is distribution, there is storage, there's paying the folks that cut the meat, et cetera. And so it's only worth it if you really can get that relationship. Um, but I think to do your part on that is, you know, is getting on with the chefs when they come back, getting on the food shows or the food columns where people are telling the story about uh, this project, project you're working on, because you're certainly working on something that needs to happen. There are, you know, well, well over, uh, you know, I guess, what's the number, a couple hundred million uh, animals farm for meat every year in the United States. I, I forget the number. I used to know it. 10 billion, 10 billion animals farm for meat every year in the United States. So it's a, it's a monstrous question that you're raising and one that uh, we're making some progress on. But those would be my initial thoughts, Harry. And it's good to see you again. Thanks. Good to see you also. Great. Thanks for the question, Harry. Um, all right. Next up, we have a question from Zach. Hey, how are you guys? Uh, calling in from New York and uh, recently switched from uh, consumer packaged goods like Bite Coco over to the food tech world. And I know, uh, Walter, you had talked a lot about tech adoption. And um, so I'm wondering in, in technology that can be business to consumer, do you see that the, the, the evolution or the adoption goes from retailer to consumer? or that the consumer brings a lot of what they wanna see in technology to the retailer for implementation? It's a good question. I think what I see is, uh, I see the, the retailer, I see the, I see the entrepreneurs trying to solve problems and try to partner with retailers to get um, an opportunity to, to apply it or to use it. And then I see the consumers trying to decide in the end if they're going to remember there's there's technology that's informing operations or back of the house. And there's technology that's informing what the retail actually experience. For example, there's a company called Afresh. They're they written, they're using AI essentially to allow operators to order their fresh product uh, more effectively and cut down on shrink. The customer doesn't really see that and accept that they get fresher product. But there's a whole uh, suite of technology that's being developed to basically more effectively uh, uh, produce, uh, you know, so that technology is not, uh, that technology is B2B. With respect to the technology that shows up for the consumer, there's another company called HALA, H-A-L-L-A, which is basically building a vertical in personalized nutrition, which plugs in so the customer can come in and tap into um, ideas or suggestions on what, what they should buy that would fit into their particular lifestyle. So in the end, I think it isn't really being, uh, driven by the customer per se, any particular technology other than the customers who made it clear they want to be able to pick up at store and they want to be able to pick up and they want to have it delivered. That there, they have said very loudly, make sure you can do these two things. They don't really care how you do it. You just have to be able to do it. The growth in BOPIS or buy online, pick up at store is well over 200% right now, year over year. And the growth in delivery is well over 100%. These are monstrous numbers. And so there's a number of ways that that technology companies are solving for that. It's not, there's no one way. Everybody's got these different platforms. So um, I, would, I would say it's, uh, it starts with the entrepreneur or starts with the retailer trying to solve a problem. The customer validates it, except in the, 
the meta themes or the mega themes that the customer said, serve me in these other ways? I think, Zach, that was a really excellent question um, and one that I want to spend more time thinking about. You know, one thing to add to what Walter mentioned, um, millennials and Gen Z represent about 150 million people in the US. And this demographic is rapidly gaining purchasing power. And particularly when you think about who is the key purchaser in a household of groceries, I mean, that demographic over the next five to 10 years is going to have a huge impact on how this industry develops. Um, so while I think that the grocery stores are doing things and they'll be implementing technologies, um, I suspect that this group, um, particularly Gen Z, that is totally digitally native, um, they'll just have totally different expectations in terms of how they find products, how they receive those products, um, how they interact with them digitally and physically. Um, and I think that there might be models that we haven't really thought of today, just like TikTok, you know, three years ago, who was talking about TikTok? Um, so I, I, I feel like we don't really know where this is going, but in the next five years, I expect to see some big shifts because of that big bulky demographic that's coming online. It's a very good point. And that group has a, a whole new set of values around sustainability too. But one more point yep. to your question. I do think that in addition to Bopis and uh, delivery, they have basic expectations that the website's going to work at a certain speed, load at a certain speed. You've got the ability to navigate it at a certain speed. Those are kind of functional, basic things that cut across any business. If you can't get on there and perform within a reasonable time, people will just leave the site. They won't do business. So I think every company's got to have a basic, you know, uh, and again, those things are all rated out there by Google and by Gartner. You can actually go look at how your site is performing uh, relative to the standard. So th there's basic expectations of every customer that if you're going to be a digital player, you have certain performance standards on your site in terms of the experience. But I think the answer to your question, it's coming more from the retailers and the technologists around trying to solve problems that they see. Great. Thanks for the great question, Zach. Um, and our final question before we break um, break and go into breakout rooms is from Mike Lee. Hey there, Mike Lee. Uh, I co-founded and co-run Alpha Food Labs with Danielle. I know how hard she's worked on this event uh, along with the SGG team and her team. So a uh, big virtual round of applause uh, for her. I think this is a great series. I look forward to the next ones. Um, my question is uh, the modern food system. I feel like we've had this sort of everlasting tension between large consolidated entities from production to distribution to retail and smaller mere more decentralized production distribution kind of retail systems. When you think about going forward in the future, what's the sweet spot and the right balance between big and small? Well, I don't really like the, I don't really like to, um, the, the premise of the question is there's some, you know, one's good and one's bad. And I don't really, again, as I said before, I really feel like it has much more to do with the the quality of the values, the quality of the starting point, whether it's big or small, that matters a lot more to me because we need both. We really need both in order to create this sort of change that we're all seeking here. We need the scale of larger businesses. They move mountains when they decide to do something. So um, I think uh, now I've forgotten your question. Help me out here, Audra. And I'll come back. So, <laughs> are, so thinking about larger, there? more consolidated <laughs> systems versus versus small I was, thinking, I was thinking mike lee was a senator from utah though but um, um <laughs> no you answer the question and i'll i'll pivot i'll come on your question okay yeah for sure um so yeah i i really appreciate that question um i it's hard to say where we'll net out largely because in the midst of covid i mean we're seeing record numbers of unemployment and so while this like demographic of 150 million is coming online and their values are very much centered on better for you, better for planet, regenerative products, and they're willing to pay a premium, that's what the data says. Um, we're also dealing with unemployment numbers that are through the roof and that obviously is creating food insecurity and heightened price sensitivity. And so I think there's, um, I do think that the entire system is going to be moved towards a more decentralized model because I think technologies are enabling the cost structures to come down and to make it more um, palatable from, a, from an economic perspective. But um, 
it, it's hard to say because I think with so many Americans that are food insecure, um, like hunger in the U.S. As, is at record levels this year, it's hard to say everyone wants this because if you like there, there's just a threshold that at, like you have to meet your basic needs. Um, and at some point, like folks just can't like the price point just doesn't work. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't. I mean, I think in the future, as folks care more, we will move towards smaller systems. Like, I feel like we've kind of reached the peak in terms of the economies of scale that we can achieve in the consolidated models that we've seen. Um, like, I don't know how much more efficiency you could squeeze out of what we've built, um, but I don't know, yeah, like where we meet, where that middle is, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, one last point on that, Mike, is that um, one of the things that the COVID exposed is the um, the, the nature of the uh, consolidated supply chain, which which um, which which caused at the minimum people to go back and build resiliency in their supply chain by having multiple sources, and some of those were local sources. And so I do think that that resiliency will continue to be built because it just makes good sense. Second of all, climate change is certainly uh, making agriculture uh, less predictable. And again, for that same reason, companies are going to build resiliency into their supply chain by having multiple sources, particularly local sources, to make sure they actually have product. And that's one of the promises for indoor agriculture. We, did, we wrote another report on indoor ag, which is up at SGG site, uh, talking about the potential for indoor ag to contribute to supply chain resiliency over the next number of years um, as it moves beyond herbs and greens. So those are reasons to suggest that the local systems may well um, play a role alongside the, the massive production systems, just because of the resiliency reasons and because of climate change reasons, there's, a, there's good economic sense for them and good economic and business sense for them to be there. I also think the customer continues to uh, want that and like that story and to the extent that we're able to that use these new data systems or the new platforms to tell those stories, I think it'll continue to produce uh, growth. But interesting would be for you guys to look at is the fact is our, our uh, alternative infrastructure is woefully underinvested in the United States. The co Coman network, the producer network, that is woefully underinvested compared to the, to the, to the major large production system. Um, even though we built out the retail, uh, we haven't really built out the production side of that thing in a way that's as uh, robust or sustainable as we'd like to see in order to be able to really support local food systems. Thanks for the question, Mike. Um, and thank you to all of you for your questions. We there, I know that there's still so many more and I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all of them, but just know that we've shared everyone's social contact information. So we will be available to continue the conversation. Um, if you participate in the full series, then we're gonna have a Slack room that we're gonna create that's dedicated so we can continue these kind of discussions on an ongoing basis and not have them contained just to the event so that you can asynchronously, asynchronously connect. So we hope that you'll join for that. Um, so thank you for all of these great questions. Thank you for all of the time that you have shared with us, Audra and Walter, for all of the insights you've shared and your wisdom. Um, now we are going to um, break you out into um, into breakout groups. You know, while this virtual forum lets more people experience our gatherings, there's still no replacing the serendipitous connections that come from our live gatherings, which are really special. Um, and so in an attempt to foster some of those casual collisions, we're gonna end by placing you all in breakouts. We understand that not everyone enjoys breakouts. So you can opt out by simply exiting the Zoom. This is the official and the main program. So you won't be missing anything if you leave. Um, if you do join the breakout, we encourage you to introduce yourself and to share, maybe, maybe share one thing you've learned this year that has really changed the way you think about your business and or the future of retail. Um, you know, as I've said, this is the official end of the program. Um, we're going to be sending out a thank you email, which will have the, this, the discount code for the series. And we're also going to have a link to a survey about the event. This is our first virtual event. Um, and we really need your feedback to help inform future conversations. We want to make this special. I mean, if you can't tell from me and, you know, the questions and my comments, um, I, we really want to create this beautiful space for people to connect. And so your feedback really helps us do that. Um, so 
thank you all again. I'll be here at the end if you want to come and chat, but if not, I hope, I wish everyone a happy holiday season and a ha very happy new year and hope you enjoy the breakouts and meet some cool people. All right. Thanks so much.